Hi everyone, this is Matthew Jenner for Card Runners, and I'm here with Button and Blind Play Part 5, playing our entire range on the button when facing a check. And in this video, I'm actually going to write out what I would do with every single hand in our range. So let's go over a quick outline for the video. We're first going to quickly go over the four hand types I typically check back on the button. We'll later see if I'm coming close to checking the right amount of each. So it's not that helpful if I just put down like, oh, I bet these hands and I check these hands. We want to make sure we have the right types of hands in our checking range, the right types of hands in our betting range, that it seems reasonably balanced. So I want to go over the four types of hands I usually check back so we can later see if it looks like we're checking the right amount of each. And then I want to randomly generate a flop or two and write out what to do with our entire range. So let's visualize the four hand types. So here are the four hand types I'm usually checking back. The first are some nut type hands, likely with removal effects. So it's just hard to value bet like pocket kings on a king 7-2 rainbow flop. Also, it may be nice to be able to raise some turn cards or comfortably call large bets, and that's easier to do if we check back some really strong hands on the flop. These types of hands make up a very, very small fraction of our flop checking range, and sometimes they don't check back any really strong hands. So this one's probably the easiest one, just be aware. Sometimes I will check back some really, really, really strong hands, especially if they have a strong removal effect, but that only makes up a super small fraction of, of our flop checking range. The second type of hand would be strong hands not afraid of giving a free card, and which kind of like facing bets from the opponent on later streets. So if the flop comes king 7-3, king 2 would be a really good example of that. I'm not afraid of giving free cards with this. I don't want to get check raised, and it gives me something to value bet later. So, betting king 2 on this flop is clearly profitable. You probably can bet any two cards on this flop, flop profitably. But it's probably better to check king 2, and by checking it, we're going to be able to call bets comfortably on the turn in the river with this hand, and also it will let us bet with a balanced range on later streets, since we can bet king 2 for value and put in some bluffs. So next would be hands with showdown value, which don't retain their equity as bets and dislike facing bets from the opponent. So that would be like ace-8 on the king-7-3 board. We're trying to show down this bad boy and win with ace-high, or just get lucky on the turn in river. So I would usually check ace-8 on the king-7-3, hoping my opponent lets me check it down and win with my ace-high hand, or I would just hope that I get lucky and I turn an ace or an 8, and notice by checking ace-8 on the king-7-3 board, we're likely in good shape if we turn an ace or an 8, because by checking with ace-8, we keep our opponents, um, you know, we keep like ace-2, ace-4, ace-5 in our opponent's range, so we can outkick our opponent if we turn an ace. And likewise, if we turn an 8, we keep very weak hands like 8-jack in our opponent's range, which will outkick the opponent if he has jack-8 and we have ace-8 on the 8 turn. So I would check ace-8, and I would check, you know, a good amount of like ace-high um, hands here or like weaker pairs. And exactly which weak pairs to check on this board isn't that easy, and we'll talk about that later, and we've already talked about it a bit in the previous videos. All right, so the fourth one is just some pure air. This one I've been especially bad at doing in the past. So I think a good example would be, like, if the board comes king of hearts, seven of hearts, three of clubs, just check back ten six of spades. Ask yourself, what is the most effective way to play a hand with 0% equity? In other words, when would you prefer to bet a 15% robust equity hand compared to a 0% equity hand? So now let me show you exactly what I mean by that. You want to bet the hand with robust equity on the flop since it can make the nuts on a good turn in river. So if you have a hand like 8-6 of clubs on this flop, you for sure want to bet it. You know, we've talked a lot in the past about how 3 to a flush and 3 to a straight can make some very, very strong hands and it's easy to barrel. So if you have 8-6 of clubs, definitely bet it here on the flop. But with a hand like 10-6 of spades, this hand's really, really hard to improve. Um, we can turn some gut shots, but we, it's very hard, very hard to run a runner a straight. We can't run a runner a flush. There's not that many great pairs we can turn a river, because even if we turn like a 10, we're often going to be out kicked by other 10s. So if we have a hand like 10-6 of spades, to me, this seems like a hand that we should bluff later rather than on the flop. Let's bluff our good hands on the flop that can make some really, really strong hands. Whereas if we have a really, really crappy hand, let's sort of just check it back on the flop. That way, if our opponent bets the turn, we can just muck it and we don't feel bad about it, right? Like if we check back 10-6 of spades here, and then the turn card comes to two and our opponent bets, we're going to have to fold some hands. Well, we'd of course like to fold just the absolute worst hands because we don't feel bad about folding them. 
So we can check back 10 of 6 of spades on the flop, intending to fold it to our opponent's turn bet. And then if he doesn't end up betting, we can bluff it later, like on the river, where our hand quality won't matter. Look at it this way. We need some hands that check back the flop, check back the turn, and then bluff the river if our opponent checks to us. To me, a hand with 0% equity seems really good for that. Because again, the good bluffs I want to use on the flop because now we're making the pot bigger. So I want to bet with hands that have the potential to make really, really strong hands and win a giant pot. But if I'm just going to check back the flop, check back the turn with a really, really weak hand, I can, you know, if my opponent bets, I'm just going to fold and feel okay about it because I'm folding the weakest possible hand. But then if the flop checks and turn checks and our opponent checks the river, then I can say, okay, cool. I have 10 high with no kicker. Now I can bluff this terrible hand. I'd rather use the good bluffs on the flop and wait to bluff on the river with the really, really weak hands. Now, this is where it stuff gets kind of tricky. Because in reality, even though we just talked about these four hand types, we're often going to have a hand that doesn't fit perfectly into one category. We've talked about a lot in the past how even the terms like value bet and bluff don't even work perfectly on the flop. So you're not always going to have a hand that fits perfectly into one category, but I want to give you a sense of what I think our checking back range should look like. And I also want you to keep in mind, especially for this pure air type hand, keep in mind that I've said some pure air. So even if we have a really, really, really weak hand, we probably have to sometimes bet on the flop and sometimes check. But I do know one leak I've had, and I think it's a leak a lot of people have, and it's a reasonably important leak to fix that's not super difficult, is you do want to check back some really weak hands on boards like a king 7 3 board, so you can fold to your opponent's turn bet and not feel bad, and so you'll have some hands to bluff later. In reality, people probably bet way too often on the king 7 3 board, especially when they have pure air like 10 6 suited, because they say to themselves, hmm, I know 10 6 suited is a profitable bluff right now, so then they just bluff it, where in reality, it might have been better to check it back on the flop and then bluff it later. So just keep that in mind. Hopefully, this will start to make more sense as we start writing out all the hand combos. All right, so I have the 45% button opening range for 602 combos, and we're going to put all 602 combos here into one of these categories. I have four in my check back range, four in my betting range, We've already kind of gone over this, but I'll discuss it a little bit more as we do it. But let's just go ahead and jump in and randomly generate a flop. All right, so we have jack five, four rainbow. So hand number one is jack of hearts, five of spades, four of diamonds, rainbow. Okay. So we're kind of just going to make our first run through here and then see how easy it would be to exploit like our, you know, our default or what our gut reaction was for what our range should be. So I'm just going to start putting in, you know, the obvious hands where I think they go. So for some strong nut type checks, let's check pocket jacks and that, that'll be it. That's all we're probably really going to check back. So for strong two street checks, again, when we, whenever we do analysis like this, we're going to almost always follow like general rules. So here I would just say like, let's check back jack two suited. Oh, we don't even have the, the weak suited jacks. Okay. So let's check back jack seven suited, jack six suited. So right off the bat there, it looks like if we only check back like jack six suited and jack seven suited, we might not have enough jacks that we're checking back. So we can maybe check a few more. So let's see, jack seven, let's, let's add jack eight suited too. So that's going to give us nine hand combos. Again, these are some hands that sort of want to see our opponent bet on the turn in the river and we'll likely bet if our opponent checks to us. Even if the turn card's not a great card, we'll still be able to usually get at least one sheet of value with these hands. Um, we can also check back some hands which want to get to showdown. So this one should be a little bit easier. So the hands that I want to get to showdown with, I'm going to put like ace 10, ace 9, ace 8, ace 7, and ace 6. And that alone, if each one of these is 16 combos, that's going to be 16, 32, 48, 64, 80. Okay, so now we need to pause and talk. So even on this first hand, I'm already seeing like right off the bat, my gut reaction is like, there's some hands on this board that seem like they're relatively straightforward checks that are like weak hands that really, really want to get a showdown, but there aren't really relatively straightforward checks that are going to um, be able to like really face multiple bets. Now, if the board were ace high or king high, it'd be easier to check back some of these strong two street checks because we'd have, you know, ace four off, ace three off, ace two off, king eight off, king seven off in our range. 
Likewise, if we were playing heads up, we'd probably have jack two off, jack three off in our range, you know, if we're playing heads up poker. So we don't have that, though, for um, for six max in a button opening range. And if we look at the big blind flat versus button range, the opponent does not have pairs of jacks better than jack 10. So it's really hard for us to sort of justify checking back a hand like queen jack, king jack, or ace jack, because those hands are only beat 2.3% of the time. So that makes things pretty difficult here. And makes things a little bit trickier. So we have a couple options here. The first would be is we could start value betting on the flop with hands like ace-10. Again, the term value bet definitely doesn't work perfectly here. But what I mean by we could bet ace-10 on the flop for a value is ace-10s only beat a third of the time on the flop by the big blind. Uh, the big blind only has a weak pair 33.8% of the time. So ace-10 will often bet and get called by a worse hand. And even if it doesn't, ace-10 will be able to outdraw the opponent reasonably often when we turn an ace or a 10. So I definitely shouldn't use the term value bet. But what I mean is we can start betting ace-10 on this flop, and it would be like, I'd probably classify it as like a medium strength value bet. It'd be a very weak medium strength value bet, but that looks reasonable. It definitely wouldn't be like, you know, one of the easy bluffs. It's not like a three to a flush three to straight thing. So that's one thing we could do to make us, to make our checking back range a little bit smaller. I think that seems pretty reasonable here. And then since our range is so much stronger than the big blinds range, we can probably be betting pretty aggressively. So we might not need to check back that many hand combos. So we've got that down right there. Let me, um, and the other thing too, we've talked about models a lot in other videos. If we start betting the turn, if our opponent checks with the turn and we decide to bet, we're allowed around one bluff for every value bet. So if we have these 12 hands, which are going to be able to value bet later, and we might even be able to like value bet ace nine or something out of here later too, we probably can have like, I don't know, like 15 to 18 bluffs, something like that. We can have at least 12 um, probably even a little bit more than that. So let's let's put that there as sort of a placeholder for right now. Oh, cool. And then I just realized now, which is great, we should also be checking back hands like I think 10s to 7s make good checkbacks. So that's going to give us another 24 combos. So this bumps this up to 33. Okay, so now between these three nut type checks, these 33 strongest checks, and then... Um, we're also going to be able to, that's going to be 36 hand combos right there. So we're going to be able to probably bluff, you know, a, at least 36 hand combos, maybe a little more. So let's bump that up to 40. And then now, if our check back range is like 40 total garbage hands, 64 sort of like ace high hands, and then 36 strongish hands, that's starting to look more balanced. I'm trying pretty hard not to turn this into a theory video. And this stuff has been talked about in other videos. It's been talked about in the 2 plus 2 book. But... We also want to keep in mind that if we check back the flop and we face a turn bet and a river bet from our opponent, maybe we'll fold half of our range on the turn, because we can fold enough that our opponent can profitably bet any two cards. So maybe we'll fold like half of our range, maybe 40% of our range on the turn. So that's the same thing as to saying we'll defend maybe 50% or 50 or 60% of our hands, and maybe we'll defend 60% of our hands on the river. So if we did check back the flop, defend 60% of our range on the turn, and 60% of our range on the river, then that would mean we defend 60 on the turn, 60 on the river, equals 36% of hands total. And then here, like right now, 36% of this range would be our nut type hands, our strong, um, our strong two street checks, and then we would have to just, you know, I don't want to say hero call down, but we'd probably have to call, you know, a turn and a river bet with some like ace nine or ace eight. That seems pretty reasonable to me. So as of right now, it looks like we're checking back 140 combos out of 532. This range looks pretty balanced to me, meaning like it looks like if our opponent checks, we're going to be able to, you know, bluff most of our bluffs either on the turn of the river. And if our opponent bets on a future street, we're going to be able to call down with mostly pretty good hands. We can obviously raise, especially the pocket jacks on the turn of the river. And, you know, some of our two street checks might improve to hands that can raise for value as well. So this range looks pretty balanced. It plays well if our opponent checks the turn or if it bets the, or if he bets the turn. So I'm right now editing the video after it's already been released. And the reason why I'm doing that is because we're talking about the button opening range. But when I made the video before, I accidentally used the big blind flatting range at times when I should have been using the button opening range. I made that mistake because it's very important to look at both ranges when you are figuring out how you want to play the button opening range. But I made the mistake of putting hands 
when I was writing down the hand combos, I was putting down hands that aren't in the button opening range. So hopefully we've cleared all that up. If there's still a few mistakes left over, I apologize for that, but hopefully this should be pretty clear. Now, this is kind of both a good and a bad thing. The good news is I just spent a while totally changing the whole range and getting everything written down exactly the way I want to. The bad news is I think it's kind of beneficial for you to see me sort of struggle when I make the range. And because I had to go back and edit it, I already had a lot of stuff done. So you're not going to get to see me, you know, try to figure out exactly how I want to make things work. But I am going to go over why I put all these different hands in different ranges. And of course, this isn't like an optimal solution. No one knows what that is. I'm sure I'm making plenty of mistakes here. So you can now hear why I want to take the line that I want to take. All right. So the strong nut type hands that I want to check back on this flop are just going to be pocket jacks because they have such an incredibly strong removal effect. So that's going to be the only really strong hand I check back. And then below that, I have strong two street checks. And when I say strong two street checks, I just mean if I check these hands back and my opponent checks on the turn, I'm probably going to value bet both the turn and the river. Okay. So hopefully this will make it a little bit easier to see. Sorry about that. All right. Now, let's just go here. Okay. So these are the kind of hands that are obviously very profitable to bet on the flop. I don't have any problem betting any of these hands, but I don't want to bet my entire range on this flop. So I need some like pretty good, but not amazing hands to check back. So I, tried to de so I decided to check back, you know, the Jack eight, Jack seven, Jack six suited, because all these pairs of Jacks can be out kicked or split against my opponent, as well as tens and eights. Um, I'm value betting all the jacks that have a better kicker than a nine. So jack nine and better, I'm value betting down here. All right. So these are the, again, these are like kind of the good hands in my flop checking range. Now below that, I have hands that want showdown that I'm not going to bet on the flop. So those are like ace nine, ace eight, ace seven, ace six off. All of these hands can easily win at showdown against the big blind calling range. So I'm checking them back on the flop because they have showdown value and they don't have robust equity. I mean, that's pretty much exactly the hand type I look for when I check back on the flop. I look for hands that don't have a lot of robust equity and have showdown value. So that's exactly what we have here. I'm also checking back ace four, ace five, and then king five, king four, queen five, queen four suited. So I'm checking back 20, I'm sorry, I'm checking back 36 weak pair combos. And what I want to note here is and again, I'm not sure this is right. This is just typically what I do when I'm actually playing is I'm a little bit more likely to bet the fours that have like um, the really weak kickers, like four, three suited, and then check back the turn. Because with a hand like four, three suited, I feel like, you know, it has some really robust equity if I turn a four or a three. And if I do turn a three, you know, my opponent could have made a straight, but it's not that likely that, you know, that the three can't really in improve him to a pretty good pair. Whereas if I have a hand like, let's say, queen four, queen four I like to check back because that way I keep my opponents like queen eight off in his range. And then if I check back queen four and the turn card comes a queen, my opponent turn top pair, whereas I turn two pair. So I feel like I get to win a reasonable size pot. So again, this isn't stuff I feel that passionately about and I could be wrong, but I want to bet some, I want to bet a couple fours, but mostly check back my fours. And the fours that I chose to bet are four, three suited and, um, so it was five, four suited and there was a, there should be a four, three suited somewhere. Oh, sorry. Five, four suited is two pair. Here we go. Uh, four, three suited and six, four suited. Those are the pairs that I, those are the pairs of fours that I decided to check back because they do have three to a straight. They do have a little bit more robust equity. And I think when I, you know, I'm not looking to sort of keep my opponent's dominated hands involved like I am when I check back the king five, king four, queen five, queen four. Um, and since I'm checking back the turn anyways, I don't think there's going to be that much betting that goes uh, that goes on. I'm going to bet the flop with a very weak pair of fours and then just check the turn. And then hope my opponent doesn't bet the river usually. Okay. Um, so yeah, so that's the hands which we're checking back that kind of have showdown value that don't want to face future bets. Whereas I'm more okay in kind of rooting for my opponent to bet when I have a pair of jacks or so. All right. And then these I wrote as likely future bluffs, but what I mean by that are these hands right here, these are just like the really garbage hands that I'm checking back on the flop that I might end up bluffing later if they don't improve. So I ended up checking back King 10, King 9, and King 8 off because these hands, I think, allow me to keep more of my opponent's dominated hands involved. 
So if we look at a hand like King-9, I don't mind checking back King-9 because it keeps my opponents like King-8, King-7, King-6, King-3 in the hand, and it keeps my opponents like 9-10, 9-8, 9-7 involved. So I feel like by checking back King-9, I keep more of my opponent's dominated hands involved, and if I do want to bluff, I can bluff later. Um, King-10 is a hand that I might call a lot of turns with. So if I check back King-10, it still keeps a lot of my opponent's dominated hands in. But I'm also going to call on the turn if the turn's like a 9, or a 10, or a queen, or a king, or an ace. So with King-10, it's like, yeah, I'm checking it back on the flop, even though it's a profitable bet. Um, about half the cards, if my opponent bets the turn, I'll probably fold to about half the cards in the deck. And then probably fold to a little more than half the cards in the deck. And then so while I don't know if this is correct, I'm justifying it by saying, hey, I keep a lot of my opponent's dominated hands in the hand, and I also like being able to check back some hands on the flop that can kind of like float again on the turn. In this case, I can, you know, turn a gut shot or an open in a straight draw, call again, and then have a hand that doesn't have, a, you know, any showdown value that I can bluff with on the river. All right, so here's some more kings that I'm checking back. Um, and then I'm just kind of checking back these hands, which were kind of just like the most garbage hands I could find. Like 9-7 of clubs is just garbage. So, you know, it wouldn't be terrible to bet it. It has some robust equity. I think betting's profitable. But I want to check back some garbage hands that I can just fold to, on, uh, fold to when I face turn bets. And this range right here is pretty much going to be the garbage hands that I fold to. Um, most of this range will fold to turn bets if it doesn't improve. So I just recalculated this, and I accidentally wrote King-7 suited instead of King-7 off. So there's actually 59 really weak hands that I'm going to just check back on the flop. I know they're garbage, and I'm just going to fold them to turn bets if I don't improve. Okay, so the next thing I wanted to talk about is we don't need to defend a certain amount on the turn after we check back the flop. So, you know, there's just no way to solve for that. There's no way to solve for, you know, if we check back on the flop, how, you know, what is theoretically optimal for how aggressively we should be defending when we face a turn bet. That said, if we did call on the turn 60% of the time and called on the river 60% of the time, and if we never raised, we would defend 36% or so of our check back range. So this is still pretty new for me, but when I'm writing down like all the combos that I want to check back, if I'm thinking to myself like, okay, if this right here makes my check back range, and I'm going to end up defending, you know, like a little more than a third of the combos on the turn and river, what I've noticed is we're of course going to defend you know, we're, we're going to raise our nut type hand that we check back on the flop. We're obviously going to call with these hands. These hands aren't going to fold to a bet on almost any turn or river combination. And then we're going to end up defending with some of these hands, but not all of them. So, for example, if, you know, the turn in the river are like, let's say like the turn's an eight and the river's an eight. We might end up folding, you know, we're going to fold a seven and a six for sure. We're going to fold ace nine. We'll probably defend with our ace eight and even raise some. And then we're going to end up calling with some of these hands, with some of these weak pairs. They're just bluff catchers. We're going to probably end up releasing some and calling with some. So the way I kind of visualize this range right now is, you know, this is the slow played component. This is the component where, you know, they, these hands would make really profitable flop bets. But I want to check back some stuff that can call turn bets or value bet later on. So these are, you know, the good hands I'm checking back. These hands, I'm going to probably just keep checking back if my opponent checks back. Maybe I'll... Sorry, I'm going to keep checking these hands back if my opponent checks. Maybe I'll find a bet on the turn of the river with some of, like, the pairs of fives. But for the most part, I'm looking to check these hands back. Um, and these are going to be the hands that sometimes call, sometimes fold when they face a turn in a river bet. And then these garbage hands right here are usually just going to fold to turn or river bets. Or, you know, be bluffed. Or we'll bluff these hands if our opponent checks to us. Um, so apparently I'm having trouble getting the words out. But all I'm getting at is... These hands right here, I'm probably going to end up folding if my opponent bets and I don't improve. And I'm probably going to end up bluffing with these hands if I can and I don't make a pair or something. Because these hands won't win at showdown and I need some hands that can bluff later. So I'm probably going to bluff a good chunk of them if my opponent keeps checking. Okay, so this is the check back range. Alright, so now let's move on to the betting range. So this we've done a ton of times before in the past. I listed the strong bets. I listed the medium strength bets, and then I listed the draws, and then everything that's not listed would be a hand that I would bluff with. The only thing I really want to explicitly mention is I am betting, I am considering a hand like Jack-10 or Jack-9 a very strong bet on this board, because if you remember, the big blind three bets, queen, jack, and better. 
So it might take a while for you to get used to that, but like Jack 10, when we're on the button, has a really good kicker here. Because if we look at the big blind flatting range, the big blind was three betting all the hands that had good, better kickers than Jack 10. And the big blind was calling with lots of hands like Jack 9, Jack 8. Honestly, the big blind could probably even call it Jack 7 off or Jack 6 off, and I wouldn't mind. Um, as well as with a lot of worse suited Jacks. So Jack 10 has a pretty good kicker here, and I would definitely consider it a value bet. Jack 9, same deal. Um, the Jack 9 will obviously get stronger as the opponent's calling with more Jack 7 and Jack 6 off. But even with this range, Jack 9 is still doing quite well. It's it's not very often outkicked. Um, all right, so I wanted to mention that. Then we have, like, all of our two pair of stuffs. I'm also betting with pocket 7s. I checked back the 10s and the 8s because they're not really that afraid of giving free cards. It's still not great to give a free card with a hand like pocket 10s, or especially with a hand like pocket 8s, but they're not that afraid. Whereas a hand like pocket 7s, pocket 7s are just more vulnerable. You know, if the turn card comes in 8 and we check back pocket 10s, that's totally cool. Because if our opponent turned a pair of 8s, we still got the better pair. Whereas with pocket 7s, if we check back, if we check them back with the turns in 8, it's not cool if our opponent turned a pair of 8s because now we lose. So that's why I tend to Bet with the weaker pocket pairs. Um, I also bet twos and threes down here for the same reason, even though I just arbitrarily chose to call these a medium strength hand bet, whereas sevens I chose to call a stronger bet. But I, I tend to bet with the weaker, more vulnerable pairs, whereas the pairs like tens, nines, and eights, I'm a little bit more likely to check them back because I'm not afraid of giving a free card. Again, there's no way to tell for sure that could be wrong. Maybe I'm betting too few or betting too many. And for the medium strength hands, Again, pretty much arbitrarily chose when I was just going to call a hand in medium strength. But if we look at the big blind calling range, the big blind only has a pair a third of the time on the flop. So because of that, I think we can bet hands like ace-king, ace-queen, ace-ten, kind of for value. Because our opponent will call with a lot of hands that we beat. He'll call with aces that we beat, like ace-nine or ace-eight. And even when these hands are behind, there's a good chance we're going to outdraw our opponent by the river anyways. So I'm betting these hands on the flop. Once my opponent calls, I'm probably going to try to check down and use their showdown value. It's, it's probably not that unlikely that I'll bet the flop. My opponent will call turn four, river eight. And then if the turn checks through and he bets the river, I'll just call with ace king. No big deal. Um, five, six, five, seven, six, four. You know, same deal as the ace king, really. These hands are just weaker pairs rather than high cards. But when I, when I bet the flop, I can get value from my opponent's, you know, weaker pairs or high cards. And then... If uh, he does call my flop, but I'm almost certainly checking the turn. And then, as I already mentioned, twos and threes. Like, I, I don't really ever want my twos and threes to get called when I bet on the flop. But I can get value from my opponent's weaker aces. I don't want to give a lot of free cards. I'm just going to bet the flop with threes. And then if he calls, I'm going to hope the turn in the river check through and I win at showdown. And then some very lonely draws. There's just seven, six suited. All right, so after tying up all the hands, I had 207 hands not listed. And that seemed like a reasonable amount of hands to bluff here. We have, you know, 96 strong value bets, but they're not that strong. We have a good amount of medium value, medium strength value bets, some draws. Around 200 bluffs here seems okay. And a lot of the hands we'd be bluffing with would be hands that are like three to the flush. Like they'd be like, you know, queen three of diamonds or something like that. Because the only ones we were checking back were queen three of clubs, which didn't have the backdoor flush draw. So you could write this stuff out. And I did write, uh, did take a note. Know that these bluffs include some very weak hands, but they usually have a bit of robust equity. So I was checking back a hand like King-9 because it didn't really have that much robust equity, and I wanted to keep more dominated hands in the opponent's range. 10-9 off, though, I would definitely bet this on the flop because it has 3 to a straight, so it will double barrel pretty well. And if I you know, bet the flop with 10-9 and I make my opponent fold his King-9, that's pretty cool because I made him fold a hand that you know not only beat me, it dominated me on a 9 turn. So... You could write, we could write out the rest of the hands, which I'm not planning on doing for this video. It's already going to run over an hour, I believe. But um, just know that if you did list out these bluffs, you would probably find that a lot of them do have really low equity, but they also have, usually have some like pretty robust equity. Um, and even like a hand like ace two, ace three off, those are like gut shots here. And then yeah, 10, nine off is just three to straight. I'm trying to find a hand right now that just seems really crappy with no robust equity, but I pretty much checked those back. It was like the 9-7 and the 10-7 of clubs. Because the, you know, the, the suited, the suited 9-6, or maybe, yeah, like 9-6 is still 3 to a straight. But most of the 9-6 we bet, if not all the 9-6 we bet, is going to be something like 9-6 of spades, which can just definitely get there. doesn't have a lot of equity, but it has pretty robust equity. Though that said, I wouldn't mind if um someone checked back like 9-6 of clubs or something like that. I think that'd be fine. 
Okay, cool. So the video is not over, but this is the end of my editing. So hopefully it will smoothly transition to the stuff that I did a couple weeks ago. So let's get a sense of how strong the big blind's flatting range is here. So the big blind has two pair or better, again, not very often, less than 3% of the time. Top pair is going to be pretty much capped at ace nine. So, okay. So not many two pair combos, quite a few top pair combos though. But the top pair is capped at ace nine, so not a very good kicker. All right, so let's see what hands we want to bet. Let's see what hands we want to check back and probably bet two sheets for. So I think the most obvious ones are going to be like some weak aces in some hands like pocket kings and pocket queens. So let's start with kings and queens, which gets us 12 combos. I think we want to check back some weak aces. So let's check back ace five to ace two, which will be another 48 hand combos, and that brings us to 60 total. So quite a lot here. Um, and we're not positive we're going to be able to bet these hands for two streets of value. Like, it's possible we should only bet once. It's going to depend on what the turn in the river is and how strong we think our opponent's turn checking range is. But right now, I'm going to put these in, like, they're the reasonably strong hand camp, right? Like, if we have kings or queens, we can pretty comfortably at least call bets for our opponents bet the turn and the river. So let's just keep that there. And then now, let's put some hands which want to get to showdown a little bit more. So let's put, like, king 10 here, which is 12, queen 10, 12, um, jack 10, also 12, 10, 9, 12, and then we get to the suited, I believe. Right, 10, 8 suited. So let's just do 10, 8 suited to 10, 6 suited, which will be another 12 combos. And, again, there's no rule to know exactly, you know, whether or not to put the when we're classifying hands, hands don't ever, you know, fit a category perfectly. So I know there's not that much difference between king 10 and pocket kings. But at the end of the day, we have to put hands somewhere when we're trying to sort of organize our thoughts. So this is where I chose to put them. All right. So let's see what that gives us. So that gets us 60 hand combos. I uh, actually do prefer to value bet jacks. So let me just put that here so I don't forget. Okay. So we have three nut type hands, 60 pretty strong checks, 60 marginalist checks. And then let's see what we have for hands we're going to want to make future bluffs with. So again, we can use that kind of general rule. And if we're going to be betting these hands and these hands for sort of two streets usually, and then, you know, that'll let us bluff about 65 hand combos right there, give or take, it's just an estimation. And then maybe we can actually bluff a little bit more for these hands since a lot of these can bet at least one street of value. So let's just say I'm going to want to check back around 70 really weak hands that I plan to bluff with later. Just thinking about it a little bit more, I'm not sure what we want to do with all of our pairs of sevens. We probably want to mix it up. We can bluff some sevens. We can check some sevens. But I think I like checking back the king seven and then the queen seven suited and the jack seven suited, which is going to get us another 18 combos. So that gets us up to 78. So yeah, so a lot of hands here that we plan to check back. And then these hands, I think we're almost never going to bet. We would just try to get those to showdown so we can keep around 70 bluffs. So... I have us checking back this flop quite a lot. So we'll have to see if we'll have to see if that seems reasonable after we put in some, you know, after we look at our betting range. And if we find out our if we find out our betting range is still too strong, then we can start betting some hands here that were originally checks. Okay. Alright, so what are the strong value bets? So we had ace king to ace jack, that's thirty-six combos. Ace tens another nine hand combos. Pocket 10s is another three hand combos. Pocket 7s is another three hand combos. 10 7 suited is another three combos in this case. All right, did I miss anything else? I think we also have like ace 9 and ace 8, right? We do. We have ace 9, ace 8. Um, Let's put ace 9 at least here. I think we put ace 9 and ace 8 in the strong value betting range. Like these are still pretty good hands, they're very rarely beaten. Yeah, of course, we're not always going to be able to bet all three sheets with ace-9 and ace-8, but we will be able to bet all three sheets reasonably often with them, I would think, especially the ace-9. But um, let's consider a hand like ace-6 more of medium strength. Okay, so we don't have that many. So as of right now, I'm already just looking at these ranges. I don't have that many hands that aren't planning on, you know, barreling all three sheets at a pretty high frequency. So maybe there's something we can tweak in a minute. But for right now, let's just start here. All right, so let's see how the ratios are starting to look, because I think this one's going to be a bit off, and we'll have to fix it. So we have 36 plus 9, that's 45, 48, 51, 54, 54 plus 24 is 78. 
And then we have around 18 hand combos here for like the medium strength value bets. So we're betting a reasonably polarized range when we bet on this flop, which doesn't seem bad, but we, we want to be aware of that. Okay. And so if we were to use around two bluffs for every value bet here, we'd want around, you know, 160 bluffs total. All right. And then we, you know, one thing I should have put earlier also is we need to also have draws, which we can talk about in a minute. And technically we need some draws in the checking back range. So that was a little bit of an oversight by me. So let's actually put some draws up here too. Okay. Um, we'll get to that in a second, though. So let's see. If we had 160 bluffs, then we had about 96 bets. That would mean we have about 250 combos plus some draws we're betting. And then we have how many hands we're checking. 70, 70, that's about 150. Because it's about 210. Oh, once again, it looks like we're going to get reasonably close to using up all the combos. Because right now I have about 210 combos in the checking range. And I have about 260 combos in the betting range which is only 470 combos, but we haven't added in the 40 or so the forty or so um, draws. And I think that's actually going to make everything come together. So once again, the ratio... Or, so once again, we're just... Even at a glance, I'm kind of just coming really close to the general ratios we're using, letting us use up all of our hand combos. So I think that's mostly just a coincidence and me getting kind of lucky when I'm making this video. But I do imagine there is a good amount of it that just comes from the theory, where it just happens to work out that if we're, you know, putting hands in the right ranges, the ratios just happen to kind of work out pretty well on themselves. And again, that's something that's talked about a lot in other videos and models, so we won't go into too much detail. That said, I am happy that these ranges are just working out that nicely at a first run through. You'll have to use your own judgment on this, but even though I'm going to show putting draws in both the checking and betting range, in reality, I would heavily emphasize betting your draws in practice. Yeah, in theory, you probably need to check back some draws so you can have the flush on various turn cards in your checking back range. But unless your opponents are really punishing you for not doing that by check raising you aggressively and over betting the turn aggressively when the draw comes, then I wouldn't really worry about it too much. So you'll see me put flush draws in both ranges, but for the most part, I would usually bet them. So let's count how many flush draws we have. We have 37 flush draws, but if we look 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, if we look, 10 of our flush draws are actually the pairs of aces. So we have 27 flush draws that are just flush draws. Like, they don't have a pair. So what I would say is, you know, if I was really trying to get better at this in theory and stuff, I might say, like, check back 6 flush draws. Or maybe, like, let's say we check back 7 flush draws, and then we bet 20 flush draws. I don't have, I'm not very passionate about which flush draws you should bet and which ones you should check. I mean, if you have like a straight and flush draw, I would probably bet it. If you have a flush draw that has showdown value and you think you keep a lot of your opponent's dominated hands involved, you might want to check it back. So for example, maybe you'll want to check back like king nine of clubs here. But again, I don't have a very strong preference. But I can see how someone would argue checking back king nine of clubs because you do have a showdown value with king high, which might occasionally come into play. And you can also check back and, you know, if you turn a king and your opponent has king four, then you outkick him. So I don't have a strong opinion about where your flush draws go. In reality, I would bet just about all your flush draws in practice. But, um, you know, in theory, check back some flush draws and, and bet some flush draws. I know I said I was going to write down every single combo, but hopefully you can see why this would just get very cluttered, confusing, and it'd be very time-consuming. So if you don't understand sort of which flush draws are good to bet and which ones are good to check and why it's really close with a lot of them, just feel free to go ahead and ask me in the forums and I'll help you out. All right, so we're just going to put seven flush draws there, 20 flush draws there, and then let's look at our straight draws. So again, in theory, you're going to do, you know, check some straight draws and bet some straight draws, but in practice, I would just say, like, I would bet pretty much all the straight draws. Because straight draws have not, like, a, a lot of robust equity, and they have no showdown value. So in reality, I'm especially just going to bet all the uh, straight draws. Again, maybe in theory you should check them once in a while, but even in theory, I think you're going to bet just about all of them. So 15, so 9, 8, which would be 15 combos. So that gives us the 35 draws that we're betting there, and then 7 draws that we're checking here. Okay. So I just counted the total combos that we have if we stick with these numbers. We have 218 checks, 291 bets. That gives us 509 combos total. And the actual number of combos we have is 507. 
So again, we just probably got lucky and we're insanely close at the first run through, which is nice. It makes me think that we, we probably are doing pretty well. All right, so let's just go ahead and talk about. We can just talk about what hands we would we would um we would check back, and then we would know that we would bet everything else. Okay, so the kind of hands I would like to check back here. Let's go over right here. They're again going to be stuff that keeps the opponent's dominated hands in his range. So, for example, let's start it off with King Nine. King Nine doesn't really have very robust equity. Um, I like the fact that I can check back and I'll, I'll often win and I'll kick my opponent if a king run a nine turns. So I would check back some king nines, but I wouldn't check back the king nine with um, a king of clubs or the king nine with two spades. So that means, you know, one, so there's three, there's, let me think, there's three king nine offs with a king of clubs. There's one king nine of spades and one king nine of clubs. So we're checking back eleven, or we're checking back eleven king nines, and we can do the same thing for king eight. We're checking back eleven king eights. What else are we checking back? Um, queen nine, I think, makes turns more gut shots and stuff than king nine. So queen nine, for example, can turn an eight, which gives us an opening in straight draw, or a jack, which gives us an opening in straight draw. So I would not check back queen nine. Um, we don't have queen eight. So let's think what else. Is there any other hand that's kind of like the king nine, king eight? Um, king seven makes a pair. All right, so we could also check back, let's say, king six suited, which will be two combos. We, we, we would have bet the king six of spades. We could check back queen. No, we don't want to check back queen eight either. A queen eight means we have a nine is an open and a straight draw, and then a jack is double gutted. So yeah, you got to get really good at these things too. Like even when I think of Queen Eight, it takes me a moment to realize how many different cards turn me an open-ended straight draw. I'm not that fast, so I can usually see like Queen Eight here, and I'll be like, "Wait a second, I know Queen Eight turns some straight draws, but I actually have to stop for a moment and think. Okay, how many both the Jack and the Nine give me an open-ended straight draw? So be aware. Wait, does the Nine? Yeah, the jack and the nine both give me um, an op open into straight draw. So yeah, so try to get better at that if you're not really, really quick. So we're not going to check back queen eight. Um, queen seven, no. Queen nine, no. All right, what else? I think we maybe can check back a hand like pocket twos, pocket threes, or pocket fours. And we maybe will bluff them later. So with twos, threes, and fours, I don't really like betting on them all that much on the flop. Because it's really hard to get value from your opponent. So we might bet twos on the flop, and the opponent will call with king jack, or, you know, if it's in his range, and a lot of people will have it in their range, or or queen jack, or like jack nine. But we're not going to get to showdown with pocket twos. Our opponent will bluff and will likely have to fold. So I think we can actually check back like twos to fours. Um, and we're going to have to often bluff these hands ourselves. So just remember, even if we go like check, check on the flop, check, check on the turn, and we know we can check on the river and sometimes win with pocket twos. We still might need to bluff it because bluffing might be more profitable than checking. So I think we can check back with twos to fours, and we will probably have to bluff them later. Because if, like, the turn in the river ran out like this, let's say, we need to make our opponent fold as random sevens, sixes, and fours. Um, so, yeah, I think we can we can check back twos to fours. They're, they're, not, they're, they're obviously quite bad hands on this flop. Despite having a good amount of equity and being, you know, the best made hand on the flop a lot of the time, they're just not – we're not going to be able to bet it and then actually get to showdown and win very effectively. So I think we can check those. And then we also could probably check, like, a lot of just, like, as I talked about earlier, like, the really, really bad hands. So, like, jack six suited. There's just not that many good cards that can turn. So, like, jack six suited would be two combos. Um, trying to think what else. So I added in the rest myself just to save time. And if you look, it's just the really, really bad hands. There actually aren't that many hands in our range that don't have, like, some sort of gut shot, some sort of, like, three to a flush, some sort of, like, three to a straight, which is really nice. But I think, realistically, these hands are just not going to improve very often. So I decided to just check them back, knowing they're, you know, as close as we can kind of get to our zero equity hand here, or zero percent equity. Especially a hand like 4-3 suited here, which is just terrible. 4-3 suited with no runner runner flush is awful. So these hands I'm checking back. I didn't get the exact number we were looking for, but I was within a couple combos, and it's all an estimate anyways. So here's what I have. But I also want to mention, in reality, I don't think I would bet 
as aggressively as I'm recommending here. I think I would actually check back even a few more hands, planning on either bluffing them later or giving up. Because here, with the ranges that we have, we have the big blind calling really, really wide with a lot of crappy hands. So the big blind is going to fold when we see bet on the button pretty often. Because he's calling with so many crappy hands, and he three bet all of his good stuff preflop. In reality, I don't think these are ranges most people are using preflop when facing a min-raise in the big blind. I think our ranges are much better and much closer to game theoretically correct than the ranges most people are using. So because of that, when they do call our preflop open, I think most people we're playing against are going to have a range that's much stronger than this. So just know in practice, especially if you're playing like really low stakes and people are a little bit too tight from the big blind against the button open, I would not be c-betting super, super aggressively here. So right here I have a c-betting about... um you know, maybe like 56, 57, 58% of the time. Whereas in reality here, I would probably only see bet about half the time, maybe a little bit less than that. So even though I'm really happy with how well our ranges are working out when we're doing them, you know, our estimates relatively quickly, just know that especially in practice here, I would widen this checking back range. I would check back even a little bit more. All right, so we've got about 10 minutes left and I randomly generated the next flop and then my microphone had a little bit of a problem. But that actually might be a good thing because that lets us sort of start off a little bit ahead. So with this randomly generated flop, the first thing I wanted to do is check back my strong and that type hands. But right here, I'd really only recommend checking back like pocket queens. Um, pocket queens block two thirds of our opponent's top pairs, which are usually gonna be the hands that call down if we go bet, bet, bet. So I'd probably rather check pocket queens on the flop. Whereas pocket jacks, I'd go ahead and bet them because we can still get a lot of value from our opponent's queens. So just checking back pocket queens and then the thing that I think is most important here is I talked about how before, how I'd be pretty lenient with checking back like, you know, queen two, queen three, queen four, queen five. If we had, um, you know, those hands on a board like queen seven, six, because I want some hands that can check back on the flop and call turn in river bets. But on this born texture, since it's queen jack six, we already have hands like ace jack, king jack, jack 10, jack nine that do well when our opponent bets into us on the turn. So because of that, it's less crucial that we check back hands like queen two, queen three, queen four, queen five. So I don't really have a strong preference either way. Personally, I would rather mostly bet those. So I'm really only checking back, you know, the queen two and the queen three here. And you could even bet those and I wouldn't have a problem with it. Whereas hands like ace jack and king jack, those hands I think are even more comfortable bets because, you know, they have a little bit, they're a little bit weaker, but ace jack and king jack also block one of the potential overcards. So I would definitely check back ace jack and king jack because when you check those back, there's only, you know, if you check back ace jack, really only a king is a bad turn. Whereas if you check, you know, queen two or queen three, both the ace and the king are a bad turn. So um, these are the hands that I'm checking down that I'm probably going to be able to pretty comfortably bet the turn and the river if my opponent checks to us again. And that's going to be about 30 hand combos right there. And then we're also going to have a lot more uh, medium strength hands like, you know, actually, you know what? We should even probably put jack-10 up here. Jack-10 for another 12 hand combos. Since our opponent doesn't have a pair of jacks better than jack-10. Okay, and then the other hands we're going to want to probably check back that we're going to bet later are going to be like jack-9, which is 12. Then we have jack-8, jack-7. Sorry, jack-8 suited, jack-7 suited, and jack-6 suited, which is going to be 9 total. Then I'd also go ahead and check back 10s uh, to 8s. So, and that's going to be 18 more combos. So that gives us 20, so that gives us another 39 combos. So again, we're just sort of putting hands in different categories to make it easier to visualize our range. There's no big difference between Jack-10 and Jack-9, even though I put them in different lines. And then, you know, the last thing we're going to want to do also is we're going to want to add in some like ace high hands. So let's go ahead and do that. So I would say, let's check back our, uh, let's check back our ace-9 to ace-7 at least. And that's going to be, um, let's say we do the offsuit one. So that's going to be like 13 combos. Ace-8 is 13 combos. Ace-7 is 13 combos. I'd go ahead and bet the Ace-10 because I think our opponent can call with some weaker aces and then Ace-10 has more outs in the form of gut shots. So that's another 39 combos. So that gets us to 78. And while it's, of course, going to depend on the turn and river, I would say as a good rule of thumb, these hands we're all going to bet twice. So if our opponent checks us on the turn and the river, we'll probably bet both streets on most turning river cards. You know, it gets close, but these hands we're probably going to bet like once. 
So, like, you know, maybe we'll bet the Jack-9 twice, but Jack-8, Jack-7, Jack-6, Pocket 10s and Pocket 9s will probably bet, like, once. 8s we may or may not bet, but if we do bet it, we'll probably bet it once. And then Ace-9, Ace-8, Ace-7, we're pretty much always going to just try to check down and win with the Ace-high with those hands. Now, overall, I think we have a pretty strong checking range here. We're checking a lot of hands that just aren't that afraid of giving free cards. And then we do have 42 hands that can probably bet the turn in the river. So I think we can be a little bit generous with our bluffs here. So rather than use sort of just like the one-to-one -one rule, you know, have one bluff for every strong two-street check, or, and then, you know, we'd also have a few nut-type hands so we could bluff more than that. But rather than just bluff like 45 to 48 combos here, I think we can be even a little bit more generous. So I would say we can probably check back like 55 or 60 hands. I even say towards the higher end. Maybe we could check back like sort of 60 bluffs and we'll still be okay. Because again, we're betting a lot of these hands for one street later. And then we also have, you know, a few nut-type hands and some hands that can probably bet turn and the river really comfortably. These hands just aren't afraid of giving free cards. So yeah, so I think 60 bluffs would be okay. So I just counted all the checks, and we're checking about a total of 35% of the time, and that includes the, the 60 bluffs we haven't really added yet. So we're checking 35% of the time and betting around 65% of the time, which seems reasonable-ish enough. Personally, I would prefer to check a little bit more on this flop in practice, but also, I don't min-raise on the button in practice, so I assume people are cold, and I think also most people cold call with a range that's significantly stronger than this. So just be aware of that even though, you know, we're betting 65% of the time on this flop with the range we have right now, we're not, you know, just like going crazy and betting any two cards like a lot of people do, but know that I also think we can be a little bit more aggressive with our bets because we gave our opponent who cold called in the big blind such a weak range. If your opponent's ranges are stronger and they're cold calling pre-flop with a lot more, you know, Queen Jack, King Jacks type of hands, and then, you know, there's just also folding more of their very weak hands, then you probably can't bet as aggressively. Okay, so let's add in the total bluffs. And as I said, I think we want, you know, 60 seems good. So I would start with checking back the King 8 and the King 7. We've already talked about that. They just don't play well as bets. They don't retain their equity well. We can bluff them later. But I also think we want to check back, um, like, 8-7 off here. So that's going to be, like... The, um, even though it's 3 to a straight, like I get how 8-7 has a pretty reasonable 3 to a straight, but if a runner runners like the 9 and the 10, we hit a very bad end of a straight, and it just doesn't seem like the hand's good enough. It just doesn't seem like the hand has enough equity. So I would just go ahead and check back 8-7 and, you know, consider that like the garbage hand that you're going to bluff later if you do decide to bluff it, which we very likely will. All right, then we could also check back a lot of these low suited stuff that don't have the 3 to a flush. So a lot of these suited, random suited things, like let's say 5-4 suited, I'm going to bet that if you give me 3 to a straight and 3 to a flush. But with just like 5-4 to spades, I would check it back. So I'll go ahead and add these in right now after pausing. Okay, so I added the rest in right here. So king 5, king 4, king 3, king 2 of spades, 7-5 of spades, and 4-3 of spades. And then I didn't have quite enough combos, so I also decided to check back like the ace-5 off. Um, ace-5 off, ace-4 off, ace-3 off, ace-2 off all seemed like they could be pretty reasonable checks. And in practice, I think I'd be pretty likely to check them all back against a lot of opponents because, again, I just think in reality, you're going to be playing against people that have stronger cold calling ranges than this. But for this right here to get up to 60 combos, just check back the ace five off. You know, there's no way to know exactly how many of these really weak hands we should be checking back to bluff later. But 60 seems reasonable. If you wanted to even go a little higher, I think that would be fine. Because again, I just think we have some pretty good hands that we're checking back here. And then the last thing to mention is, so I guess I also had us, um, since I'm only checking back these hands, then that means we would bet hands like twos, threes, and fours. I think that can be okay, because if you bet a hand like twos, threes, and fours, it's possible the opponent calls on the flop with a hand like ace, nine, ace, eight, ace, seven, and then he lets you win at showdown. In reality, I'm just going to repeat it one last time. I do think in practice, people will have stronger ranges, and I'm more likely to check back on the flop with like ace, five, ace, four, ace, three, ace, two, and also probably like twos, threes, fours, and fives. But I definitely don't have a problem with betting those either, especially as the opponent's range gets very weak. So that's pretty much going to take up all the time that we have for today. And I hope this video really helped you sort of visualize your flop range when you open the button. What hands do you bet with? What hands do you check back? I know we're talking about a lot of stuff now that doesn't come close to modeling perfectly. 
like my old theory videos from you know two years ago almost always dealt with dealt with models that were like hey we're betting on the flop or the turn with a perfectly polarized range we were dealing with like much simpler situations that were easier to model whereas here we're not doing that at all nevertheless i still think at least for me it really helps to be able to sort of like put hands into different groups write out what you're doing with all your hand combos to help you visualize what you do with your range and then you can kind of look at these ranges and say hmm if my opponent you know took this is what my opponent checked back on the flop how would i exploit that and right now when i'm looking at it right here it doesn't look like there's that easy of a way to exploit it it looks like it would be pretty difficult which makes me think hey this is a reasonably balanced flop checking range is it perfect of course not but to me, it's kind of good enough, and it gives you something to keep building off of, even though you understand the models that we use to get, like, rough estimates of ratios and, you know, putting hands into different groups. That, of course, doesn't work perfectly, but it at least, in my opinion, gives us a good start, and that's something we can continue to build off of, even though we're never going to get the exact way to play our flop, um, our flop betting and checking ranges. So I hope you enjoyed the video. I hope you were able to sort of find some leaks you had in your range. I know me personally, I have the hardest time just remembering to check back these hands when I think I can profitably bet any two cards. But even just looking at my ranges right now, I think if anything, I'm still not checking quite enough hands to bluff later. So hopefully you found some leak like that in your game, and then I hope you just enjoyed watching it. So thanks for watching, everyone. Good luck and take care.